Welcome everybody to the live cast. Uh, today we're talking with Yasmin and not Tim Ruswick about a wonderful game called Cult of the Lamb. We're going to go in depth. We're going to talk about uh, some of the game design, some of the things. Rick or I have not played this game. Yasmin, our wonderful guest, is going to walk us through uh, some of the game design and uh, all that stuff. Before we get started, Yasmin, do you want to tell everybody a little bit about yourself and uh, kind of what you've been up to and, you know, kind of stuff you do in game dev? Yeah, sure. Um, so, hi, thanks for having me. Uh, I um, share game dev tutorials over on my YouTube channel. Uh, I'm also a musician, so uh, I kind of dabble in making music videos in game engines and in my day job, I'm a te yeah, technical game designer. So, yeah, that's me. And if anyone watching at the moment wants a, an audio course by Game Dev TV, spam Yagman X channel. <laughs> like, go over there, find Yasmin. Like, we really want that course. We've been asking for it forever. So, you know, I dabble in music is a, a code for saying I really, really want to create a Game Dev TV audio course. Wouldn't that be amazing? <laughs> music <laughs> and audio. Yeah, great. good comment here from uh, Side Sidenator. Side uh, she only does everything. I think that sounds valid. That sounds uh, valid, right? Indie dev, cool. All the awesome. hats, all the hats. Okay, right. well. Cult of the Lamb. Welcome to Cult of the Lamb. I'm really excited to share this with you because I've been playing it a lot on Twitch uh, and it's a really addictive game. Let's press play, that would help. Uh, yeah, so I'll just show you kind of what happens. Tell us a little bit about the game for the people who don't, have never seen it before. And oh. oh, yeah, of course. Well, the way that this game was explained to me was it's Animal Crossing, but you are the head of a cult and uh, it's extremely dark. And I was like, oh, that sounds really, like, really um, just fun because there was a lot of games that came out after Animal Crossing, especially around lockdown and stuff that were just to do with, like, building up a community and a little world of your own that you could go off and explore in. But I feel like this game has just taken it one step further and taking it away from the cutesy, even though it's still got the cutesy art style. But um, So are you starting starting from the start or is this you've so already played? I've already started, up yeah. So I, I, I thought I'd already like show you how it is now because there's a little bit of a, like a learning curve and it takes a little while to get into maybe an hour or two. Um, so here I can really show you everything. <laughs> so these are all my followers. Um, so this is the kind of like Animal Crossing-esque aspect to it. Um, as you can see, some of them aren't very well. I should probably tell that one to like go to bed or something. Are, they, um, are these PCs or are these people? The, the icons yeah. make it look like they're actual folks mm -hmm. playing somewhere. So if you play this on your own, um, they will just be NPCs. And the interesting aspect to this is um, they're all randomized. So they actually have personalities and their personalities can either like help you on your base or they can hinder you on your base. They might get sick a lot. They might rebel against you and then you have to put them into jail or kill them because you can kill them. Um, but so the names that you mentioned, these are actually my Twitch followers. So I played this on Twitch and all these people are people who've like watched me on Twitch and became my followers, which is really interesting as well because I mean, you get to make up your own story, especially because they all have their own personalities. Like some of them don't sleep, they just work all the time. So the hard workers and you tell them like what you want them to be working on throughout the day. Um, so even just this kind of gameplay loop of taking care of people, building up your base, as you can see, I've got tents here and I've upgraded some of them, haven't upgraded all. Uh, I've got logs that I need to like collect and then this Ib dude is going to carry on doing them for me. I need to make some food for my followers, so they're not, not going to get ill. If you hate your followers, you can make them food that kills them if you really want to, because I mean, this is a cult, yeah. this is not a happy, nice game. Um, so yeah, just doing this. So if we if we can zoom up a thousand feet into the air and just have a look at what we're trying to do, is the world this entire area that we've got, like this map that we've, is that the entire world or do you have no. many different levels you go to or is it is it an open world that stretches off forever? What's the, yeah, yeah. the game space? So let me show you, this is the map. So you're in the teleporter. Okay, so yep. there's a... 
So there is a map. Um, I think I've unlocked everything. I'm not sure though. There could be more spaces because uh, it just keeps on um, like zooming out basically to show you something right. new that you didn't even know. When I first started playing it, I literally thought it was the base. And then there is a dungeon crawling rogue like aspect to it as well, which I'll take you to in a bit. But as I've been doing the rogue like bits and progressing through the main story, which is you're trying to release the demon that sent you back on this earth to be a cult leader. So actually you're you're kind of doing everything for him. Um, you've actually unlocked all these different places. So down here, I can go and fish, so I can get like good fish for my for my little my little followers. Uh, I also managed to like this lighthouse, and now I have some pilgrims here who also pray to me, and um, I can take their prayers. And basically, it unlocks things for my base, which makes my life a lot better. I can like fish if I want to. So you've got? Do you have a currency? You're trying to grow. I see hearts in the top left. The the AI, AI sorry, the UI. I'm not talking about AI. Mm -hmm. The UI looks pretty pretty smooth. The whole art style looks super continuous. Aesthetically, yeah, um, it's great. Really nice. How would we describe this art style? It looks um, like cardboard cutout pop up style. Paper Mario kind of style, a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a two point five D, isn't it? So it's two D sprites on like a three D environment. Um, but yeah, I, normally, normally, if I was to see that, I'd expect a, a depth to things. But it looks like they're, yeah, a la Paper Mario. The rock at the front mm. left there looks like it's intended just to look like a, a, a plane. Everything looks like planes, mm -hmm. as opposed to oh, it zooms away when you go over there. As opposed to yeah. making it look like it's isometric with depth. Yeah, yeah, it is all two D. So like here, the visibility, you've got like a, co a cone of view that you can like, it pierces through it. Um, yeah, camera's yeah. interesting too. Like it kind of zooms in on whatever it thinks you're focusing on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that is true. That's um, pretty easy to do in Cinemachine as a side note. There's a couple of courses we go through that in terms of the, when you get into a particular um, state, then it zooms in or you get, you know, hit a trigger, you can have it zoom in, zoom out. So there's no excuse for us as game developers not to have dynamic cameras if we're using Unity. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know Unreal so much from a dynamic camera point of view. Um, Yasmin, I don't know if that's... Oh, if you it's know so, about... so simple. Yeah, it's mm. so simple to just ease in and out of select cameras which are there and just hidden, yeah. obviously, by the player. But I'm just looking at his animations. Like, there's so many details to just make this game amazing. Like, it's so cute. He looks adorable. But then if he walks left to right, he's got this <laughs> such an evil look about him. Just like, <laughs> he's just loving just being evil. Yeah, we talk so much about polish, and it's something that I think, I don't know if you agree with this, but I think it's better to make a tiny game that looks really polished and and has all the bounce and zing and wiggle and, and personality to it than it is to make a game that's bigger, you know, a couple more levels, a couple more features, a couple more characters that doesn't quite have that polish to it. Because people will forgive you, I think, if if like, wow, that was amazing, but I only there's only an hour of it, I want more. They'll forgive yeah. you more on that than saying, well, I kind of played for 10 minutes and then lost interest. So I don't, I just don't even know if there's three hours to it. Yeah. Yeah, that's so true. Um, so I'll just tell you a little bit because you, you did ask me about the, the UI. So up the top left, mm -hmm. that is um, the hearts are to do with when you're in the dungeon crawler. So we'll go in there in a bit because um, you can actually... I don't have anything enabled, but you can you can upgrade stuff so that you can kind of use things in your base to allow you to have more hearts before you go in and do that, um, which will obviously benefit the main story. Um, so this here is basically everything that I've unlocked for my base. So little things like a lumber yard, all of our resources that we need. Tech no, it's, it's exactly that. Yeah. So we're we're unlocking elements to to then unlock more elements. So you see this hard white line here. We can't get to anything in this section until yeah. we've unlocked enough within this. You don't have to unlock them all to unlock the next one, but you have to choose at least enough, which then it also makes it random for each player because you can choose to kind of play the way that you'd like to play and have your base have the things in it that you want yeah. want 
in it. And you can make it as, as difficult or easy as you want as well, because we have things like demonic summoning circles, which uh, allow one of your followers to have the spirit of a demon in them. And then you get to take them into um, the dungeon with you. So you can have like multiples of those. I think this is for two. Yeah, so you can have two demons and basically they're just little AIs that are like helping you out chewing at things or becoming a bomb just something to give you a bit of extra help but if you don't want them because you you're like really good at the game you don't want any help obviously you don't need to unlock these if you don't want to you can unlock everything else around it the first half of the game you're actually you see yourself die <laughs> and then um you meet the demon and the demon brings you back to life and then you start within the dungeon crawler just so you're getting a a good grip of like how to move, how to attack and okay. things like that. And then you get sent here, I believe, with the first follower that you have to indoctrinate. And there okay. is a there is a man who kind of takes you through all the things that you need to do. So he says, you know, make sure that you build, um, I think it is this shrine. You have to build this shrine first of all, because this is what gives you your major upgrades. And then from there, you just kind of figure it out and uh, go on. And what are your followers actually doing? Are they are they like um, in a say if it was an RTS, you might have villagers, and the villagers are off harvesting gold and running back to the base, or off chopping down trees, or coming back. Uh, yeah. In this game, what are your villagers? Do they have a, a resource collection role? I know you said before about some of them get sick and some of them are a pain in the butt <laughs> and some of them do whatever, but what's their what's their responsibility? Yeah. I guess what's their so job on the team, Yasmin? What are they doing? <laughs> So honestly, most of them are such a pain in the freaking ass. So like sacrificing them is fine by me. Well, not not my Twitch followers, but th this is the great thing about whether you, if you're streaming it, the experience uh -oh. is just 10 times better um, because so you can tell them what to do. So I could say, you know, I want you to be collecting logs and that one of them will go here. You can only have one at a time, do one thing. And because I've only got one log thing and one, I've got another stone collecting over here then the rest of them default to praying to the statue. And that's how we get these prayers that I'm receiving. And then I can okay. upgrade my stuff. Um, so but... prayers, prayers is feeding the tech tree you showed us before? Yeah, exactly. Oh, no, yeah, no, no. feeding, right. yeah, feeding the cool. tech tree. Yeah. And then um, when I am live streaming this, the Twitch uh, will get notifications. The Twitch chat will get notifications saying, would you like to help or hinder the streamer? And um, if they choose help, then perhaps these followers are a little bit more helpful. They help me with cleaning up the the base. They help me with um, with harvesting or something like that. Um, if they choose hinder, they could choose something like they have they poop everywhere or they're sick everywhere or mm. you know they're they're easily angered because if you don't look after them as well, because you do have to talk to them and look after them and you can give them bribes and things and dance with them, they actually become unfaithful to you. And then they can make everyone else become unfaithful to you. And the less faithful followers you have, the less prayers you're getting to your shrine and you won't be able to use them as sacrifices. So you won't be able to get their demons, which will help you through the dungeon. And um, they won't be able to if you die in the dungeon, you get to sacrifice them so you can carry on through the dungeon. So you want to keep them happy. So cool. I would love to see the dungeon part of this now. Yes, okay. Talked about it a few times. Let's do it. And so it's interesting that the game has uh, these two modalities. This is a full on dungeon crawler, hack and slash type game. Yeah. Um, and, and then there's the you know the, the i guess the farming aspect to it or the you know the city building aspect whatever one would call that other aspect um it's interesting having those two modes sometimes when games try to pull that off it seems like it's two totally separate games just kind of joined together <clears throat> how does this feel does it feel like there's a a reason to be coming in and doing the dungeon crawling and it's a you know it's a good break from doing the farming does it work well this this relationship between the two modes I believe so, yeah, because, I mean, it fits with the narrative because you're a cult leader and the only reason you're a cult leader is because your demon has brought you back from the dead. Um, but also, you use your followers as kind of extra lives, like I touched on previously. If you die, you can sacrifice one to come back. 
and um, a lot of the time if you just spend most of your time in the base just doing kind of that gameplay loop over and over you do run out of resources and it can become very grindy which is the case for a lot of games like that like Animal Crossing I've been playing Disney Dreamlight Valley recently and that can get quite grindy so here it's kind of like a shortcut to that so you can do um, you can do this and actually so you know how in like um, Dungeon Crawlers and Roguelites you get uh, a choice on the map of where you'd like to go within your next area and it will show you what, what you will gain from that area so that you can choose kind of how you'd like to play. Um, you can actually choose uh, resource uh, specific areas. So say if I, was, <laughs> I ran out of wood and I need some wood for uh, one of my quests for my followers because uh, you do actually get quests for them as well. Then I can come in here and I can hopefully gather some wood. And as you can see, as I'm hacking away at the area, I'm picking up poo, <laughs> I'm picking up grass, I'm picking up stone. So I'm, I'm getting resources Sounds like a dream come true. This. It's a bit actually, of everything. Sounds like, sounds like being a dog owner. <laughs> picking up poo, grass, stone. Oh yeah. yeah, I guess you can chuck the stone for your dog. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, interesting. Can you, if you have another fight in there, particularly with one of those boss kind of guys, maybe these are a bit different, but I think what we can learn from the encounter you had just now when we're creating an enemy that was really cool is the enemy turned towards you and then it mm. triggered its slash animation and, you know, fight, fight, fight. And in that time, you as a player could run around to the other side and hit that to avoid it. So sometimes the enemies that we create in these sort of um, hack and slash games seem a bit um, a, a bit too repetitive because all they're doing is just coming towards the player and hitting the player moves they just turn the other way and they hit that way so that's a cool thing for us to take out of it just fix for it, whatever it was the one or two seconds fix the direction of the attack like and so the player feels clever running around the other side and hitting that little mechanic alone i think is is enough to make an interesting um, enemy to fight against. But I'm just yeah, cool. it's also an interesting way, you know, essentially he was shooting a heat-seeking missile at you. Again, a mm. lot of games will just, it'll shoot straight away and, and come straight at you and, and maybe even be a homing missile, missile where you move, it'll move as well. But I really like that it popped it out, gave you a moment to see, oh, it's coming, and then it shot towards you. So once again, you can feel clever by timing your roll to get out of the way of it. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's cool. There's lots of these little um, enemy design mechanics we can take out of this. You know, related to that, the uh, UI, I noticed something that I thought was really, really cool. When you get hit, your health bar also shows above your head, which is which mm. is a really cool little detail because one of the things I've noticed with making games like this is that there's so much action taking place in the center of the screen, the UI can get lost very easily. Your eyes mm. aren't there. They're focused on the center. So putting something really important like the health uh, right over the head when you get hit is I think a really nice touch. Um, yeah, I have not met this this person before. Um, it seems to get new people all the time whenever I go through. So mm. this is also, by the way, how new areas open up on the map. Usually you'll find them in the dungeon first. So you do have to go and do this if you want to progress the overall, the overall story. Um, you'll find them in the dungeon first and then they'll say, hey, why don't you join me in this place? And then you know when you get out of here, somewhere new is going to be open and ready for you on the map, which is exciting. I think they've captured that cuteness really well. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people are just going to see the character and say, that resonates with me. That, that style or that look, the personality of the character seems really neat. And I think that's something that's really worth iterating on many times in your game until you can find a character where someone, this one, people are like, oh, it's a little lamb, oh. And then as you were saying before, sometimes he does some evil stuff. You're like, oh, but he's evil. And I think that's worth putting so much time into until you get it right, because that'll draw people to your game. And it's, uh, I, that popped into my head because Lottie is asking, what about this game first drew you to it? And sometimes it's the intangibles of, I don't know, it just kind of felt good or looked interesting. And it can be just even the personality of the main character can do that. But uh, Yasmin, what, what did draw you to the game when you were first, you know, hearing about it or, or considering it? Oh, it was honestly, it was just the explanation of Animal Crossing, but you are the leader of a cult. And I just thought that idea alone was genius mm. because like I say, there were so many 
you know, uh, I hate to say the word clones, but there was just a lot of games like Animal Crossing after Animal Crossing came up because it did so well. And I completely understand why, because there was a lot of people who craved something that they could feel like they could have fun with friends or they feel that they belong in and there was something to do every single day, you know, during COVID and lockdown and things. And then all these cutesy, cozy games came out because I feel like it is a nice time now for people to want to play cozy games. Um, but the idea that like, it's still cozy, but it has a dark side and you know, it's exploring dark themes in a cozy manner. I just, I thought that was quite unique. I haven't really seen that done many times. And you know, I do love Animal Crossing and I've been, like I said, I've been playing Disney, Dreamlike Valley. I love um, playing games where I feel like I can be connected with the characters around me, but I get frustrated with the, gatekeeping that there is within those games where you feel like there's nothing to do for that day and you have to put it down and go do something else and for this that it was just the best of both worlds uh because i've always been interested in hades as well so i was like mm. ah i'll play this it's a bit of both so you know what too there's a sort of rhythm to it and i don't know this but it does look like the character is moving twice as fast as kind of the rest of the stuff um yeah and it that kind of rhythm and and kind of speed is important because it's kind of like contrast in a visual yeah. uh sense the speed of an animation so that stuff is kind of really important i'd love to see how it looks in engine with it all just layered up because it must just look like a mess when you look at it from a different perspective because the camera's obviously at a very specific angle to get all of these things lined up because yeah. it's all just yeah. different layers of 2d yeah well that's yeah good. that's interesting as well how would it how would we go about building this if this was in unity i would um like as we were talking about before it would be a 3d space and i would just have mm -hmm. my sprites plopped in there i wouldn't be making this as a flat 2d game um it would it would be 3d with with assets dropped in there um so yeah that shouldn't shouldn't be too difficult to place them and have them look good yeah is that's something that's a little bit trickier but it's really good parallax too if you notice yeah. that the, the background objects it's very light but it's there you know as as with all these things when we're playing through these games the important thing for us to learn from it is to take this screen and say how does that compare to the game i'm working on or the game i'm thinking about how can i get some of the movement how can i oh yeah lighting i need to do something there that texture on the ground is interesting how can i get a bit of a texture on the ground and to to take that not to try to get this level of you know art excellence because this is super you know whoever created this really knows what they're doing but for us to get the elements of movement the elements of lighting the elements of you know character pacing of their animation the scene is dripping in detail there's so much of it and there's not a lot of like super unique elements to it but there's a lot of a lot of stuff placed here and it's really well placed there's so many of these systems and maps and stuff. It's, yeah, uh, it's a it's a massively system system driven game. Uh, it's very impressive. It really does feel like two games joined together. Like a dungeon crawler is the one complete game, and then a you know a farming simulator -y community builder type thing is another game. So here we've got a new follower. Um, actually, I might do that one so we can come out and I can show you how the followers are made. Yeah, and this one would be a shop. Um, I don't know what the cat represents actually, but it would be a shop for something, some cat thing. Uh, this would be the resource, resource room. So you would go in and there would be no fighting. It would just be rocks for you to hack away at and just get as many rocks as you like. Uh, so yeah, this is where you can kind of choose what you want to do. Yeah, so this is the new follower. Um, you can get them in many different ways, which also helps to make the game more exciting. Sometimes they'll be um, they'll be um, captured by some enemies, and you have to kind of like kill them to, to free them. Um, but this one's just on its own, obviously. And look how look how sad and lonely and, and vulnerable that character looks. <laughs> yeah, all of his family's been killed. All the skeletons around him. But yeah, so we'll we'll talk to this this dude. There was oh. supposed to be certain type of animals. I don't know what type of animal that one was. 
But um, follower awaits indoctrination. Mm. Yes. So you get to do this when you go back to your base. So we'll we'll have a little it look. Sounds like someone starting a game dev TV course for the first time. <laughs> Are they just the Twitch followers? They're just the names that have been drawn in and popped on top of people, or are they actually doing something? Is it them? Is it from their accounts? Do they need to have an account? Like, what's how, what's the relationship there socially? Mm -hmm. So, great question. Um, it's not multiplayer. Um, I'll show you how the how the followers are built when we get back to the base. Um, but basically, you can either build your follower manually or you can start a raffle and then everyone watching the Twitch stream gets a pop up on their video and it says, do you want to enter the raffle? You say yes. And then if you win, um, you get to control how that follower looks. So what okay. animal they are, what color they are. And then that follower has um, has your name above their head. I find it's a very it's a very good way to to chat with people in your chat, especially yep those who might not be as active in twitch chat there are a lot of people who like to watch twitch not so many people who like to talk in twitch mm. um <clears throat> so actually if they join the raffle and get a follower then i'll be walking around and maybe i'll say their name and we'll yep. we'll begin a story about them mm. through this follower and what they're doing and what their character is and uh it actually i feel like it's i feel like it's a really good game for for twitch yeah, streamers, that's honestly. Cool. really cool yeah it just changes up how you play it when you're streaming it. What's that thing? This seems like an easy battle. Okay, that wasn't oh. a question. That was an observation. <laughs> so that's, um, I'm stealing that person's prayers, I guess you would call it, like their devotion. Um, so where oh, we are now... Guy, sorry to interrupt. This is the guy who's swinging in one direction and then... Oh, no, he flipped. He made me look a fool. Okay. Sorry. Keep, keep going. Oh, he, oh, he take... made me look a fool. <laughs> Maybe he's just... Uh every now and then catches you off guard yes. trying what are you collecting when you're out mowing the lawn there so i'm collecting uh stones uh, things for my base basically so like okay. grass to feed my followers <clears throat> stones and do you see that anywhere base. on on your screen uh, is there a ui showing yep on the left this is what i mean it i i always miss it it comes up on the left um so it'll pop up this is calamar like calamari i think i think that's why it's called that uh, i thought it was quite fun <laughs> um so they just kind of taunt you when you're almost at them so it's calling me a snivelling coward these are other demons these or that's a really good question. I'm not sure if there are other, they must be other demons, right? They're definitely other godlike entities and they have okay. shackled the entity that has brought you back to to praise him. And basically by, by uh, killing these ones, each of the shackles that's holding your god down gets unshackled. So I think I've killed one so far or maybe two. Um, so I think I've got three or two or three to go uh but yeah so these are the main bosses that you want to kill there's a uh, lot of narrative and intricate systems and interconnected like yeah this is amazing so yeah. many details as you just saw he just made all of my followers deathly ill so now he's made my life harder when i get back to the base so yeah oh, everything seems does worth, impact seems worthwhile for you to go do this battle <laughs> Well, you hope so. Because also, if I win the battles, uh, my followers will be way more faithful. I won't have to look after them as much. Um, so okay. each system <clears throat> does benefit the other really well um, or hinder the other well. Because if I lose pretty badly, then actually they lose faith. So, wow. Okay. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Because at first, when you're explaining all this, it seemed like two unconnected games. But the more we explore with this, the more it seems very connected. Yeah, they've done a really, really good job at it. Um, so this is the cards where you get to to choose how you would like to help yourself. So I could have a diseased heart, which is a heart where it damages everything on the screen when I'm hit. I believe that only happens once, um, but that can be quite useful. Um, or you get a 10% chance to deal a critical hit. Uh, so I'll just grab that one. It's interesting. Tim and I have talked about this a few times that... I see 10% chance to get critical hit. I'm like, nah, who cares? 10% isn't enough for me to be excited about it. If it was 
fifty percent, then I'd be like, whoa! Every every second hit potentially is going to be a critical. Oh. That's really cool. So I like it when games are more more exaggerated with what they give to you. A game like this is awesome because I think there are multiple player types, most multiple mm. personality types, and multiple gamers that could play the same game and love it for very different reasons. Mm. You know what I mean? Like. The whole Animal Crossing aspect. I, I watched a YouTube video of this for the first hour and 95% of the time they were just in the dungeon. Like that was like their favorite part. And mm. Yasmin, when you started, you were showing us all the cool stuff about the Animal <laughs> Crossing part of it and talking about how great that was. So yeah, yeah, like there's different, there's so many different things and I think people can see the great in so many parts and pieces and that's what makes a good overall game. Yeah, it's a really good point um, because I will say um, in the base part of it, um, there is a area, I think it was the one, it was one of the areas that I showed you, you get to buy cards and I haven't done that before because I just have not bothered to like level up how many cards or you know what my chances are within the dungeons very much. Um, so if your focus was the dungeons and you wanted to make sure you got good cards and good options, you would be spending all of your currency um on those stalls to make sure that you've unlocked all of the cards because i've still got so many that haven't been unlocked i think i've just got mainly the default ones so it's probably also why i'm not getting very good options to choose from i could tell you're a collector oh Never yeah i do without even thinking <laughs> Even when we're doing a game analysis, you're like, I just got to go get all the grass. Thank you very much. <laughs> you know, it's right. so satisfying that I know we're not listening with um, audio, but the audio uh, feedback is so satisfying. And I don't know, yeah. to me, it's just, I've got to, I've got to do it, but that it's goes a long way. Stuff. No, it, it does. <laughs> yeah. the, the feedback and the audio sound effects and the way the animations work, all that polish goes a long way. And if something feels really good to do, players are going to do it more mm. often. Exactly. Um, you get a little rumble as well every time you hit something. That that's mm. also really nice. Yeah, feels good. Yeah, I, I'm a big proponent of really focusing on the things in a game you're going to do a thousand times and polish those. And if you just do that, you can make way more progress than if you put a little bit of polish on a bunch of things. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. Yeah, because then you run the risk of um, making it too complicated for players as well. So you might as well just try and simplify everything and make it the best it can be. Which I'm sure this game could have easily been way too complicated, to be honest, with the amount of systems it's got going on. Yeah, I, I think it's definitely already had plenty of its feature creep, right? Like it's got a lot of systems <laughs> in it. But I think yeah. they had fun with it. And I think they managed a way to find everything feel uh, cohesive, which is cool. Definitely. And I think there's a there's a right way and a wrong way to feature creep. So if you make a game and it's a good game and you say, you know what would be cool? Let's add some more secondary weapons because we've got that on our list of, you know, our wish list of backlog things to do. Okay, cool. We're ready to add secondary weapons. How should we do it? Well, you know, every now and again, when you get into a dungeon, you can choose between them and we'll start off with two and then we'll just keep adding a bunch more and that'll be cool and fun. I think that's an okay, okay way to do feature creep. I think the bad way to do feature creep is where you say, no, no, our game is not ready it's not good enough until we have secondary weapons or a choice of different weapons. We can't release it or we can't show it to people. That's, I think, when feature creep can really break your whole process. This is the boss battle, right? Yeah, this is the big boss battle. Oh, okay. Got my ghost. Okay, so the boss battle wasn't the Ooh. main guy that just taunted you. Oh, yes. No, yes. That is a very good point. Um, So... You have to do each of the dungeons multiple times um, because they have cursed followers. You, you find out that they're cursed after you kill them, um, kind of protecting their domain. And I believe there's four per dungeon. So you have to do it four times. And then once they're out of the way, a new door gets unlocked uh, and you see your progress to unlocking that door each time you defeat um, a kind of mini boss, I guess this would be. For people who haven't haven't played a lot of dungeon crawlery type games, I think way back in the day, it it well, I was gonna say there was a way of doing it. Now it's a little bit different, but that's not true. There's two two styles. One is you have the whole dungeon, <clears throat> you can run wherever, and you're not going from sort of 
closed room to closed room. You can just sort of meander around the dungeon. Oh no! Oh, I, oh no! Oh yeah, I forgot. <laughs> I always forget. Um, I can sacrifice. So I'm gonna oh, I'm okay. gonna sacrifice this one. The only one that isn't a follower or isn't a Twitch chat. Oh, that'd so be difficult having to sacrifice, sacrifice them and then followers. you come back. Yeah. Oh no! Oh wow! <laughs> That's all you needed. Yeah, exactly. I, I didn't realize you came back exactly where you died. That's yeah. awesome. Like right yeah, mid battle. Yeah, you don't have to restart. Bar. Yeah. It's good. Okay. It's good. It's very forgiving. You know, I I I totally think that this game was made for um for fans of of Animal Crossing and 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 games mm. like that as well because this is um medium like no, normal mode i'm not on hard difficulty and there is an easy difficulty as well so you can play it how you want but it's yeah it's definitely wasn't made to be extremely gruelingly difficult like some roguelites can be right it definitely seems like a animal crossing binding of isaac kind of mix yes oh mm. yeah because yeah. i really like binding of isaac as well uh okay so <clears> which is my reward why what's the question what's the game design question we're answering there um and there was a there was a literal question in our chat before does it feel tedious to have to replay the level multiple times i think the the question of are you making animal crossing or are you making binding of isaac or are you, or are you trying to make both and usually what we'd recommend is don't try to make both because you're going to make two half okay games but if you've got the the time and the team and the inclination to do so you can give meaning to one by having the other. So if you've just got a dungeon crawler and you're like, why am I doing this? Like, what's my point? You know, I'm just trying to get from A to B. Maybe you win, you get to the boss battle. If it's procedurally generated, maybe you're trying to get a score or play for as long as you can or progress as far as possible. Enter the dungeon, you know, you're just trying to get as far as you can. It's a uh, roguelike, so, you know, die and you have to start the whole thing all over again. But but what is there beyond that? Maybe you've got a meta map, you're trying to unlock some stuff, but then to have this entire other system, this whole sort of community, cult, farming, followers kind of system, mm -hmm. it, it gives meaning to that. I'm trying to collect things for this. Every bit of grass yeah. I cut is so I can do a thing in the you know my other part of the game. And then the other way around as well, after a while, the farming simulator type stuff can be like, well, I've done the things, there's not much more to do. But if you've got the meaning of, okay, now I need to I do some things so I can dungeon crawl better. So so long as the the if there's a little bit of a risk there, I think. I don't know what you think about this, Tim, but if someone, you're saying before about types of players, if someone loves dungeon crawlers but hates Animal Crossing and someone loves Animal Crossing but hates hack and slash, then do you feel that you run the risk by having two games in one that you're going to accidentally not satisfy either of those two people by making them do the thing they're not interested in? What do you think about that? I mean, it, it looks like you can minimize either game. If you don't like one of the gameplay styles, you can minimize the time you spend there. Is that correct? So yeah, yeah absolutely. Like, you kind of have to I, a little bit. But it seems like you can kind of maximize your time where you want to spend your time, which is cool. The other thing that this does is it loops really well. So you play through this dungeon, you earn a bunch of stuff, you get a new follower. All of that stuff then relates back to the like Animal Crossing part of the game. And then you, you know, have them do whatever they do. They farm or whatever. Then you need more resources. Then you go back into the dungeon. So there's this really cool loop to it. Mm. Um, the, the other thing that I want to say too is generally we talk in, uh, about games in terms of genres and one of the things one of the things that a game like this does is I think it it kind of starts with a concept so like it would be very easy for the developers of a game like this to just say let's slap on an XP bar right like boom done everybody knows what XP bar does it's great it works but instead they put like a, a prayer statue right where you collect prayers and those prayers do different things and I, I think that's really cool to thematically add things that make sense in the game. Like the fact that you're collecting followers, right? Like that's not a thing you do in traditional games, but it makes total sense in terms of a cult type of game. So um, there's a lot of thematic stuff like that that fits perfectly that even though it is generally, if you're a beginner game developer, making a game like this is not a good idea at all. It's, it's way too complex. And there's a lot of design systems that are heavily relying on each other. There is so much design in this that we're not even seeing that's behind the scenes and, and balancing mm. and how all this stuff works. <clears throat> um, but I do think it works. And I think the success of this game on Steam kind of shows that it does work. 
healing them? Are you getting? Oh some, yeah. So I'm healing? this. I'm I'm being a cult leader. So oh. <laughs> I'm um, giving my sermon, and uh, wow. I can I can do like little rituals. Um, <laughs> the more you Look talk cool. to them. Look how cool his animation is, like giving the sermon. He's like, Arr. it's very neat. It's so cute. Um, the more you talk to them, the more uh, they give you these like plaques, the plaques, um, and then you get to, gosh, how would I even explain this? You get to unlock uh, new rituals for the followers, and rituals will help you on your base. So. It'll either help you manipulate your followers to do what mm. you want them to do, or it will allow your followers to be easier to be kept happy, I suppose. So this one is perform a ritual at your temple to dis distribute money to all your followers to increase their loyalty. Um, so obviously you lose money, they gain loyalty. Or perform a ritual at your temple in which all your followers donate money to you. So it's how do you want to be as a cult leader? Do you want to be the most evil cult leader you want to be? Or do you want to be someone who's a little bit nice, you know? Mm. This is one of those things that doesn't make sense if you're making a roguelike or an Animal Crossing genre game. But thematically, it makes total sense. Right, it fits in this world perfectly. Like, absolutely, you can call your followers into a little chapel and do rituals, and like it makes sense. So, part of part of what's helps what helps this game work is the affordances and the kind of um, thematic uh, stuff that this game kind of has in it, and what the perception of a cult leader would be. Uh, so, a lot of the stuff works for for reasons outside of the game design itself. They've actually gone that far and you do actually, you can see how close to someone you are, um, which is this little mm. bar above their head. Um, and once you fill up the bar, you get the little plaque, which allows you to unlock more rituals. And they've even got a system um, for each oh, wow. character to have, yeah, thoughts. And so wow. everything that you do for all the base, uh, mm. or whether maybe you're not even at the base and they have seen someone else take a poo or, or oh, their lover has died. <laughs> um, yeah, they have this uh, system for their thoughts. It's it's so, so complicated, and they all have their own personalities. So this is their their this person's personalities, um, and that affects what they want to do around the base um, in terms of work, and also how much they want to sleep, or how often they get sick. Yeah, there's a lot of thought that's been put into so. This maybe, game. maybe this is the old grumpy man in me but i just look at this and i'm like how much work did this take man like yeah. how much work did they put into this that's totally. a lot of work yeah, i can see you going through the oh, it's okay I, I was seeing you could go through that um some oh. of the um, modification or customization of, of characters yeah like and yet another system to build tim it's like oh my goodness yeah more Th this is what the twitch <laughs> chat get to get to do if they get their own follower by the way just so you know so they get to choose like all these things yeah so yeah. yes another system <laughs> do you want to be yeah, a frog they, they wanna... can customize this with the chat itself uh so the chat um there is an overlay uh you have to set it up as the streamer you have to set up a a twitch extension that is a cult of lamb twitch ex extension and then there is an overlay that appears over the stream itself um you click to enter if you want to and then if you win the raffle then yeah they'll get a screen similar to this that's on top of my screen so on top of the video okay. uh and they yeah get to choose the form and the color and and the variant so variant is like their markings and uh they don't get to choose the traits i don't believe um they're they're randomized but yeah and this is this is nowadays if you want a if you want to make a game successful without having to be a marketing genius then the way you do it is make a game that is very twitch streamable or youtube streamable youtube videoable so that people out there with all the followers can create content using your game and then the followers right. watching it saying this seems pretty cool i'll go get this myself so you know this kind of integration i think is is becoming a uh, a really important tool in a game developer's toolkit how can we make it so twitch streamers want to play our game oh let's do this you know, let's have the followers be 
uh, you know, the followers of the cult be the followers of the Twitch streamer. There's an interesting pal parallel there as well, which is kind of fun and cool. So you're giving ammunition to the streamers and to the content creators. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I made a uh, I made a tower defense Twitch enabled game where I would build the towers and Twitch chat would choose north, south, east or west to spawn units. And um, not only was it surprisingly easy to do, the Twitch integration wasn't that complicated at all. I thought it was gonna be way more complicated yeah. than it was, but also exactly like you said rick significant increase in engagement everybody yeah. wanted that game on there all the time to the point where i was like okay what about my other games guys like calm down like this is we're not gonna constantly play this game i don't even like this game uh so yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, it's a, a it's great a good point even even people watching us live now if there was something for folks to do then it changes the interaction um yeah, yeah that's really cool <clears throat> thank you for that run through Yasmin, That's very okay. excellent. Um, and then any questions from our chat or uh, while we're waiting for questions from the chat, um, we can fire some questions at Yasmin as well. If we can it's really cool any. playing it with you two as well, because I think, yeah, when you're playing it, I mean, it's so interesting because people say to you, oh, if you're a game developer, does that ruin the enjoyment of a game? But I'm very good at switching off my my game dev brain just when I when I get immersed in the right type of game. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, this is really cool to pick it apart with with you two as well. You brought up some really good points. Yeah, I I have the curse of I have to understand how everything works all the time, which <laughs> makes me a good developer, I think, because yeah. I can you know I understand the pieces of things, but. It is a curse that like any kind of entertainment ever, I have to understand the intricacies of why it works and I annoy people because I don't shut up about it. But plus side of that is I can make content about it pretty easily. Yeah. We have a question here from uh, Lottie, and I guess this is for you, Asmin. Does it feel tedious to have to replay the level multiple times? How do they make it not tedious? Um, so I think you made a good point about the length of it. Um, it's quite short. I mean, you just watched me go through it just then. I think it only took, what, maybe 10 minutes and we stopped to chat as well. So if you want to, you can kind of just whiz through the dungeon section. It's fine. It's randomized as well. Every time you go in there, there's going to be different sections, um, different rooms to choose from on the map. Also, uh, we just ran into a new character that I'd never seen before. That keeps happening. Um, even if I go into the same dungeon, Sometimes I'll meet people that I've never met before. There'll be, you know, a new character. So sometimes it's not even about um, the combat. It, it'll be a whole section about uh, foraging or a, a new character or something. So it throws in a lot of different surprises in there that keep you on your toes. Um, and also, like I said, the actual, the base building part of it, I feel like that can become way more grindy and, and um, tedious. So actually, going in and doing the dungeon crawling bit for me is is the fun bit where it just speeds everything up a little bit because you you get to then progress in your base as well because you're getting everything that you need to progress there avocado fire asks how much does the art influence the success versus the gameplay the art seems really good obviously we we don't know that we can never know that but i would say aesthetics is a huge part of this what do you guys think oh definitely it's a beautiful game yeah. It's and it's detailed yeah. and it's animated well and it's got a very cute art style that's diabolical. That I I love that. I have a lot of my art styles is based around that kind of same thing of like uh, a cute little lamb that's also a demon worshiper. I find that hilarious. So yeah. I think there's often what what draws your attention into a game and what keeps you in a game. And I think art is very much draws you into the game. You look at it and you say that looks cool. I want to play it. So if your art looks crap, then people are less likely to give it a go. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, you, you, art can just sell stuff by itself. Like good screenshots, good trailer can just sell a game all by itself. Like without any descriptions, without anything. So keep that in yeah. mind. I mean, it's it's unfortunate for the programmers of us out there that uh, <laughs> maybe a bit a little art challenge and you're trying to make a game. I get that. But, it is, you know, it's important. Mm -hmm. It's important to think about. I do think as well that the the art would change the whole feel of this game. I mean, it is it is about a cult and indoctrinating followers and having sacrifices and helping a demon. Um, it's all fun in games because you see it like this in a very cutesy manner. But you know, I, I feel like it would just 
totally change the whole feel of the game if it was more gritty and dark. And I, I feel Payne like it style. would. Yeah, and I, I don't feel like it would have the same the audience. <laughs> <laughs> it's really weird. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, completely different audience. I agree with you on that. Um, it's a question for you, Yasmin. Uh, what genres of games do you usually work on yourself? Um, so personally, horror. Uh, I do love to dabble in the dark. So I did make um, an indie horror game called Perfection, uh, which was a game where you try to become perfect and it all kind of goes wrong. It's basically just um, a walking simulator, <laughs> but um, just exploring themes of, I guess, perfection. Um, but yeah, so those are the types of games that I like to work on. Because I don't know, for, for me, I mean, even when I got into game development, I was actually just more into telling stories or exploring themes in an interactive way, which obviously games ended up being the best format for that. So I know everyone makes games differently. Some people start with a mechanic and then they build upon that. Some people start with um, you know, start with the story and I've always started with, uh, okay, what, what message do I want to tell and how would I want the player to feel after leaving the experience? Tell us a bit more about your, like the type of role that you have on the game team and, and what that means, like what you do in that role. Yeah, someone asked specifically about that technical artist. Oh, um, Are you a technical artist or a technical designer? Tech designer, tech designer, yeah. Okay. So from what, what I does know, that mean? <laughs> okay. So a tech tech designer um, is basically kind of they bridge the gap between programming and design. So what I do is I am often, I mean, I I'm in all the design meetings and things like that. But usually I'm the one who's deciphering all of the designs and thinking of what the designers want. Sometimes I get to come up with the designs myself as well. But we think more about pipeline and performance and the systems that we already have in place, and we need to have a bit of a more of a wide understanding of how things work and how they affect one another within the game to make sure it doesn't break. Um, so we're often talking to programmers as well. So that's kind of like technical designers job role, just to think more of the mechanical technical sides of, of a game's mechanics and designs. Like, is it feasible and how can it be, how can it be implemented? Are you doing some of the implementation? yeah okay so so to give like kind of an analogy then it would be like uh idea guy says we want giant explosions for every bullet and programmers are like uh what does that mean like how <laughs> big explosions small explosions whatever and you're in the middle yeah. they're kind of saying okay well we can technically do this with our particle system and if we do this this way we can is that kind of yeah generalization of of it yeah, and we got to make sure that we ask the right questions. Tech designers are asking questions all the time. So we go, okay, you want the explosions, but uh, how big do you want them? Do you need them all to be the consistent size? Like, do you want control over that? Is, is there a possibility they could change it in the future? X, Y, Z. And then programmers, okay, how would you implement this? What do you need from me? And then we've got to come up with like a, a good system to, to allow the designers the control that they need to tweak it and get it right because it's never right the first time. Um, and then also allow the programmers to, um, to actually do their magic and put it together. Right. <laughs> yeah. Because I've definitely seen scenarios where you put designers with programmers and the programmers just get frustrated as hell. Got one more question from Lottie. How do you get into that job field? What experience was needed and did you work up to it or step into it? Uh, good question. So, hmm, do, 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 do. I... <sighs> Did you Gosh, did you make think indie it's... games to get to get into the industry as a job, or did you yeah. like straight out of? Did you go to school and then you got a job from that, or what was your flow? So I used to be a web developer, um, so I knew like JavaScript and HTML, and CSS, and that got me into uni because um, uh, they actually didn't need any grades because they just knew what I was doing, and then. Um, I studied computer game arts, thought I wanted to be an artist, realized I much preferred being a designer and just 
coding in C-sharp and Unity. So I had like the pick of the artist, which was great. So I made Perfection, that's when I made Perfection during my uni days, as well as like a couple of mobile games as well. And uh, after that, honestly, I think it was a little bit of the fact that you know, I, I made Perfection and I uploaded it and it kind of got picked up by a few YouTubers and like Kotaku, I think, as well. So it did all right. Um, but then also I was going to game events uh, under the guise of the Agman X, which is my YouTube channel. And I would make sure that I did my research on every indie dev that was there or as many as I could. And then I could go up to them and talk to them about their games and like learn about their games. And I used to play games and then I used to reach out to indie game devs and ask them if they wanted like an article on their game or a review or something. Um, so, but I was doing that for years. Um, so it was a little bit of skill uh, because you definitely need skill and obviously you need to understand how to make games and how games are made. Um, but I think also mostly it was just putting myself out there and trying to get the contacts and it's it's sucky to say but it really is who you know because after I came out of uni luckily because I've been spending all those years making those contacts I could have a lot of people to say you know this studio is looking or this studio isn't um, and even then it took me six months I think of, of just purely looking for a job um, to get a job into the industry uh, and I found a trainee position which which is an entry role into AAA. And there are quite a few that do that, to be honest. I think PlayStation either are still doing it now or they were doing one a couple of weeks ago, but they're looking for an intern. So there are quite a few AAA studios that look for interns. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a lot of hard work, but if you're dedicated uh, and enthusiastic, you don't, I don't think you realize you don't have to be as smart as you think you have to be. You don't have to be God smart, especially if it's an entry role. They just kind of want want to know that you're enthusiastic and you're willing to learn and you know the basics. That's kind of it. Yeah. And you're a nice person. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Thanks for joining us today. So good to have you uh, hanging out and thanks for showing us Cult of the Lamb. Um, oh, a lot of you. it's a deep, deep game. So oh, I appreciate yeah. you taking us through. Aesthetically beautiful, dripping with design. Fun to see and it. if people watching want to uh, hang out with Yasmin uh, over on her channel, Yagman X, search for that and you'll find her. And sounds like you hang out on Twitch from time to time. So go over there and you never know, you might end up being a follower in her Cult of the Lamb game. Look Thank at that. You. Did you do that, Tim? Gee whiz, you're a talented <laughs> <Can't see. laughs> Oh, you didn't keep it around for very long though, did you? It's well, like, there's the link, back. but it's gone. <laughs> well, I posted it in the chat. So the link's in the chat. Everybody can click. Oh, it. that's how you do it. Nice. Excellent. Thank you. Cool. Did Thanks just for say Counter Strike 3 is horrible? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, we do need to end the stream. We need to get out of here. Oh, someone, someone, st don't <laughs> listen to them. They're just trying to rile you up, Tim. Just this, please. See, Rick, this is why we, we don't do this. Breathing exercises. It's okay. <laughs> we don't mean it. Construct 3 is lovely. It's a good engine. It's easily in the top 10 engines. It's not a problem. Just breathe. <laughs> It's, I know it only does 2D and it's not really 3D and it's not really a proper okay, grown-up okay. engine. And it's, and Thank it's only you, everybody. <laughs> for coming out. It's okay. It's been amazing. <laughs> we appreciate you being here yasmin thank you so much for sharing everything with us oh, thank you it's been really nice awesome. and we'll see um, you back on here on the on the live cast sometime soon hopefully yeah 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 why not always cool. happy to be here have awesome. a good night everybody